Welcome to the second part of the introduction to the 2D cellular automata. In this session, I will explain you the core, the heart of the cellular automata, how we change the states of the cells in our grid, in our automata. Therefore, um, we look again into the file cellular automata underline 02 underline 2D the grasshopper file that we used in before. And we zoom into the part where we have the 2D cellular automata loop. For the loop, as mentioned, I use the anemone component. That's a plugin for grasshopper that you find here at the tab anemone. And here we can add a loop um, to grasshopper. Usually grasshopper is a data flow um, visual programming language that transforms the data from the left side to the right side. With the Anemone plugin, you can loop um, through some, some components, similar as we do it in our script with the for loop. We could also replace this um, Anemone loop by a for loop, but this would have the disadvantage that we cannot see the development of our cellular automata. So, the anemone is primarily used to visualize the individual steps of our program. Um, you see here the loop end and loop start component. If you place these components, um, you have the same that, I've that I'm using. And to close the loop, you connect the um, loop start and loop end points. And the D0 variables, these are your iterator variables. You can add additional ones. That's the advantage of um, Anemone, that you can add as many variables as you like. These are the same um, variables as we use them in a for loop, where you have, for example, the i as an iterator variable. Here we have the d0 or d1 variables, which you can also rename by right click on it and give it a different name. Um, that's basically the main logic and um, what happens inside of the loop. And um, that's what you do by connecting the states or the output of the variable here from the loop start component. In my case, it's only one component, which is doing something that we will look into in a minute in our C sharp script of the 2D cellular automata. And then it sends back um, the changed variables that I used here. So this can be one variable or a list of variables as I do it here or a data tree. And then I connect it back to my loop end component. And what happens now is it sends it back to the loop start and iterates once again through everything that's in um, the loop start and the loop end component connected here. Of course, you have to send back the same data um, to this variable as you have started with. To control the loop, we can define how many iterations we want to have. So this is this slider. And to start the loop, we double click on the start, uh, the loop start component. In this case, nothing's happened. Nothing happens because um, the number of iterations is set to zero. Now let's consider what um, the result of my cellular automata will look like. Therefore, I set the variable say to 30. So I want to have 30 iterations. And as soon as I set this, um, you see um, here the loop is already starting and my wonderful cellular automata produces its result. Um, so now we arrived at 30. So this output, the C is the, um, the counting variable. There you can just check at which iteration of your loop you are currently up. Okay, so now you see our cellular automata with the um, counting rule one, four, two, three. So here I collected a few rules, creates this kind of fancy outcome. I can also use different 
rules. If I use, for example, this one and restart the automata, you see you generate a different pattern, a different outcome of the cellular automata. These rules, they have um, the special property that they end in a stable configuration. So usually they do. Uh, many rules uh, don't end in some stable states. They uh, create some kind of blinking areas that switches between two changing states. Or the even more complex cellular automata, they produce a complex pattern. Um, if you look into the theory or in the other examples, they may be gl gliders or some kind of glider generating patterns, um, which are very interesting because they produce some kind of um, living or new structure that we could call a kind of living structures because they produce something, at least in the theory of cellular automata. They call it like some kind of life that happens in the cellular automata. And that's why this is also a method of the artificial life research domain. But um, now let's come back to uh, the implementation of our cellular automata. Uh, what we are interested in is the script that creates these beautiful patterns. If you open the 2D CR, CA um, script, you see uh, here we have some basic variables, uh, the number of columns that we have in our automata. So the columns are the vertical ones and the rows are the, uh, the horizontal um, uh, counting or how many cells I have horizontally and vertically and the total number of cells in my system. Here I compute the number of rows by a very simple division and here the if condition just checks if I don't if I don't make a division by zero. Okay, but important is um, this uh, variable, the states array. Now we use the data structure array. This is very similar to a list which we have used in the last session. An array is a kind of a list with fixed with a fixed size. Um, we can have a one-dimensional array or more dimensional arrays. In this case we have a two-dimensional array and the array looks like our grid. So it has um, two dimensions means one um, address in my array represents the um, columns and the other one the rows of a two-dimensional grid. And then each uh, state in each, um, under each address of the array, I can store a variable, which in my case is an integer variable. And this, um, as you may imagine, is again the variable zero and one. So dead or alive state of my cell. There is a second um, two-dimensional array, the so-called limbo world. This is because in, um, in the processing of the cellular automata, we cannot compute all the transition rules from one state of all cells to the other state of all cells at the same time, so in parallel. Our computer can only compute the rules um, one after the other. Therefore, to implement a kind of a pseudo parallel processing of these rules, we introduce this buffer value, the buffer variable, the limbo world, which is um, a variable or it's called limbo world because it's in between two states of the cellular automata, um, between state A and B. We have this buffer to store some information that we can collect as long as, as, it is, <coughs> as the automata is in state one. And we use this information in our limbo world to compute the state two. Okay, now let's look into the construction, how this will work. So we have here the two for loops. You are already familiar with this 
and this is to go through our grid. In the introduction to programming, we have used the nested for loops to generate a grid of cells. In this case, we use it to read the states of our cells in the two-dimensional grid. So um, this is to iterate through all the individual cells and ask um, what states their neighborhood, that the cells in their neighborhood have. To consider the neighborhood, we have two additional for loops inside our two for loops. So we have in total four for loops nested inside each other. And these two for loops in this part, they are used to um, consider the neighbors of each cell that we want to um, analyze if it should transform its state or not. And what you see here, that's the idea of the Moore neighborhood, so the eight directly surrounding neighbors. Um, let's illustrate this idea. Um, if we, let's make a screenshot to explain it. If we consider this part of our grid and, oops, once again, sorry, let's consider this part of our grid. And in the center, we have this cell. And for this cell, we want to compute the Moore neighborhood. These are these eight cells. One, two, three, four, five, and it's not counted, five, six, seven, eight, eight neighbors, plus the cell in the center. Now, these two loops, they um, are more, uh, a kind of a small, grid that we can go through. This is this nine cells grid. So we start from the X and Y coordinate of this cell. So the um, address of this cell in the grid. And then we subtract um, the L and M starting from minus one. So this is then the minus one, minus one, for example, this corner or this cell and then we increase it until it is uh, equals uh, if it's if it equals one so this goes three times each in each direction so that represents this grid this von neumann neighborhood and what we do um, here this line so this inside borders i will explain you in a minute and um, this is the main uh, collection of the status of the cells. So going back to my screenshot, um, we ask all the cells that we have in this nine grid, um, nine cells grid. Uh, this cell has the status zero, 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 and here we have one. So here we would have the sum that uh, have summed four times zero and now the first time one, then again zero and the next thing is one and zero, zero. So in total, the sum would be two because in our nine by, in our three by three grid that we uh, iterated through these two loops, we detected two active cells, two cells with the state one, which is stored in the sum. Then, as mentioned, we don't use this sum to do anything. Uh, we store it in the limbo world. So after we finished with these two loops, excuse me, then we store the sum in the limbo world and it's stored under the X and Y address of a cell. And we subtract the state of the center cell in this case, state one, because I don't want to count the cell, the status of the cell itself that we consider. I only want to consider the eight neighboring cells. So from my sum, which was two, I subtract the state in the middle, which is in this case one, um, resulting to the sum of one that I've counted, one active cell 
in the neighborhood, which is correct because this is the cell that's my active cell in my neighborhood. Okay. Um, as mentioned, this inside borders, um, this is a, here I call a custom function that I've defined for myself, um, where I send the same um, addresses as I've used to um, collect the information in my neighborhood. So here you see the X and Y is the address of my considered cell. So this is the X and Y coordinate of this cell. And X and Y minus one would be this. X and Y, so X minus zero would be this. And X minus zero and Y minus one would be this and so on and so on. And to ask if these cells that I'm considering is, or if they are inside the border, so if they are in the grid or not, I've um, implemented this custom function. So I send the coordinates that I want to test and the number of rows and columns. And now I just ask if the neighbor cell that I want to analyze for which I want to have the state is smaller than zero, so the index is smaller than zero. This would mean I am uh, outside of the outside of the left side, out of the left side. Um, or if it's smaller than one in terms of the y coordinates, this would be the bottom. And the same thing for the right and the top. If it's bigger or equals to columns, then I set this test variable, which is a Boolean variable inside field to false, means I'm outside of my field. And this information is what I return. So I return either true if I'm inside or false if I'm outside. If I go back, then you see I only add this um, state of a cell to my sum if the cell is inside the border. So imagine, let's make another screenshot. I want to consider um, this area. If I want to analyze this cell, and then I have here the neighborhood state one, zero. And for this cell, um, there is no cell. So I don't add anything to my sum, means I add nothing equals to the status zero. So I consider this as an empty cell. 0, 0, 0 here as well, 0, so that's the considered cell, and 1, 1, 0. So uh, the sum for the neighbors of this cell would be 3, including the out of the border cells which have the state 0 automatically. Okay. Um, what you see here in this if condition I have not used the curly brackets because if you have only one line of code, it's automatically included to the if condition. But to be clear, I could also add these two curly brackets to be correct. This is what happens if I am inside the border, I consider the status of the neighboring cells. Okay, now I filled my limbo world with um, the information for each of my cells in the grid, how many active neighbors they have. This is stored in my limbo world, all the sums of the neighbors. Now, um, what you may have seen, I read into my script a rule, which is um, a string variable, if you right click on it the item access and the type hint is a string. And, and this is the rule variable. Now uh, I read the first character of this string, which in this case, so let's say that's the string, the rule 03, oops, cannot read anymore, 0301. Then the first string, uh, the first character of the string would be zero. This is um, the first um, value of the rule 
zero. So R1, I consider this value for rule zero, rule one, rule two, rule three. So in the end, I translate this string into, so I cut it, cut out the characters. Zero means the first character, address one is then the number three, and so on and so on. And get numeric value transforms the string into a uh, value and here I, this is a casting operation to be sure that I return an integer value. Anyway, just need to understand um, what happens here. So I have in these variables, I have the values that are read from the string of my rule. So let's consider this 0, 3, 0, 1. Here I would have 0, 3, 0, 1 in these integers. And now the main part of my cellular automata is to oops, to, tr to really to transfer, to change the states of my cells. Therefore, you may remember the rules that I described in the introduction. Here we meet them again. I go through my grid, all the cells with my two for loops. And for each of my cells, I ask if the current cell in status one um, has, if the cell has the state one, if it's an active cell, then I apply the first two rules. I ask if, um, here you see the limbo world, if what I have counted, if in the neighborhood I have either less than rule number one, um, which was, what was it? Um, we've used zero, three, zero, one. If I have less than zero cells, or that's the logical operator, or, or I have more than rule two, more than three cells in my neighborhood, then my cell will die. So I will change my the status of the cell to zero if one or the other rule is true. Means in my case, uh, if I have less than zero, which is not possible, or more than three cells that I've counted in my neighborhood, then the cell will transform its state from one to zero. So here you see I've used the limbo world to store the current neighborhood uh, the, the number of active cells in the neighborhood of a cell. And here I change the status of a cell. If I wouldn't use the limbo world and would count now the neighborhood of the next cell, I would count the transformed state of the first cell that was um, that is now the neighbor of the next cell. Therefore, I use the limbo world. Anyway, the next rules so rule three and four. So this one was rule one, uh, rule, yeah, rule one and rule two. Rule three and rule four of my four rules are applied to states that are in state zero. And if in my neighborhood I will I have um, counted more than rule one, uh, rule two, which is uh, so R2 represents the third and R3 the fourth um, character. If I have more than zero active cells in my neighborhood and less than one, or less or equal than one, I transform the dead cell to an alive cell I give a change from state zero to state one. So this um, activates a cell and the first two characters of my, the first two numbers of my rule deactivates a cell or not if the condition is not met. That's the core, that's the basic idea of a cellular automata. So this is very important that you understand this transition rules of the cellular automata. And after I have applied these rules, I call another function that converts an array to a list. Because in my 
uh, to send information from one component to the other. If you go with your mouse above this variable, you see the states, they are um, sent as a list because I cannot send two-dimensional arrays between two components. Therefore, I convert an array to a list, which is easily possible if you know how many rows and columns you have. Then you can convert a list back and forth to an array, respectively the other way around. And that's what you find in the script at the bottom. So for example, convert the list to an array. If I read the list of states here to my component, I first need to convert it to an array. What was done in the very beginning, if I have introduced, where I've introduced the two-dimensional array, I converted the list to an array. And I sent here these parameters to my custom function, which, return, which returns the two-dimensional array. Where is it? Convert list to array. Here you see um, I use a for loop that goes through all elements in my list. And since I know how many cells I have in one row, I know when to break my list into the next column, respectively row. So I start, for example, from here, counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 20. And I know if I arrive at 20, I need to restart at the next column. And this is what happens here. So I set the states of um, the, the states of my list. That's my list. And I copy them to the states array with the address starting from 0, 0, which is the current row and current column. And the current um, column increases in each loop. Um, means it starts from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 until it arrives in my case at 20 because I have a 20 by 20 cells grid. And then I know, okay, now my current column, which is this counter, equals to the number of columns. So I enter this if condition. This means I increase the number of rows by one. So I jump up here to the next row and start with the current column again with zero and continue in my list until I reach again the number of columns, which is 20. Then I set back to or I change, increase to the next row and so on and so on. So that's how to translate a list to an array. And the other way around, it's a little bit more, so it's easier um, to go to convert the array back to a list, which I need to return it to my output variable for further processing. Here I just go to, um, through my array with the two for loops and add one value after the other to my list. Okay, that's it um, in terms of the script. Now let's look into the result. Um, as mentioned, here we set it to, for example, to 20. Um, and the preview need to be activated, enabled. And here I have prepared a set of different rules for my cellular automata. If I connect, for example, this 2412 rule to my rule input, then I create a different outcome of my automata or a different pattern. Um, I have looked for rules that creates, for example, um, or in these rules they usually create um, a pattern where an active cell has at least one free neighbor. So if you look around, then it's at least not easy to find here now I have the border. So all of the cells have at least one free neighboring cell. We can um, also change the seed um, to test the different set of random numbers in the in <coughs> initialization. Um, and then it grows a different pattern. Uh, sometimes it creates some kind of blinking um, areas in our cellular automata. So here the automata cannot decide which one would should be the final one because the rules transforms it back and forth. Um, 
we can now apply another rule, start the loop again by double clicking on the loop start component and generating here a different pattern. Again, one area where it's blinking. If we start with a different initial setup, we probably can avoid this or get another part in the script where we cannot reach a final state. Here it works, so now we have a nice um, kind of a maze. And as mentioned, we can transform this to a three-dimensional pattern if we found something that we like. Um, we can activate the second part of our code and enable this part and create the three-dimensional structure of our beautiful cellular automata result. We can even, or we can process this geometry as mentioned to a more complex outcome. For example, let's deactivate this preview and it's not always working. Maybe it's really it's better working with a simpler rule. With this one, the results are better. Let's run it again. And having a more sparser filling of the area. Ah, now I made a mistake to activate the extrusion of the or the, the creation of the 3D structure. So now you see the processing of my cellular automata becomes much slower because I always generate the three-dimensional buildings. Um, I've just deactivated the preview, but it still generates all the extrusions and all the objects which needs more computing time. Therefore, it's highly recommended to deactivate always this 3D extrusion part here you see how many milliseconds each extrusion needs. So with all the other components, it's around a second more per iteration. Anyway, now let's enable this script. Um, what I've done, I've, re, I've, I've created a, a union of my areas that are represented by the cellular automata and then here I added a few steps of processing the geometry to create this more smoothed geometry, which is quite funny, not really useful, but um, this just shall illustrate um, that it's relatively simple to continue with um, a created geometry to do something more sophisticated with it. I see if it's not easy to render this complicated shapes, maybe with the ray tracing. Doesn't really work. Um, in the shaded view, you can see the precise outcome of my geometry. But that's not necessary for the cellular automata. Um, the main idea that I wanted to communicate to you was really to generate the 2D structure. Um, and that's this part. Don't forget to deactivate the 3D geometry. And what I want to motivate you is really to explore different rules. So here I provided you a set of predefined rules. You can link them easily to the input of your script and um, observe different outcomes. So here that's a much denser cellular automata result that I've created with this rule. And here I have the sparse fillings um, with these rules. And here I have more these rows that I can generate. I try to find stable outcomes, but you can also create um, cellular automata rules that um, don't find a stable result. What you can do as well is to start with the initial points um, like this. And uh, now we need a different rule because here we don't create anything. Um, don't create anything as well, which is not good. With, the, with this rule, you should be able to generate a result because um, here we have these zeros means here, especially in the second part of the rule, 
you generate a cell if um, you are if you have only one neighbor. So if you restart the loop, then you see you generate a symmetrical um, result of the cellular automata because we've started with symmetrical initial points. And what you can do as well is to, of course, you can add more initial points or you move them around and then you see the automata starts as soon as I release the point. So that's uh, quite interesting how the final outcome also depends on the initial setup and the initial states of the cells. And if I disable this and start with a random configuration, I create a completely different result, of course. Okay, I hope you um, got your own idea how you can work with the, or experiment with the cellular automata. Um, it's easy to change these rules, just double click on it and enter a new um, set of values, but don't press enter um, because then you add a new line. This is not um, working for an input of the rule. So you can explore the cellular automata by changing the rules finding your own patterns um, but uh, ideally you look inside the script and experiment for example with changing the neighbors you can also extend the neighborhood um, not only considering the direct eight neighbors but um, going to the distance of two from your central cell um, which means uh, if we make here a screenshot, if we start from one of the cells, for example, this one, then the Moore neighborhood would be these eight cells, but you could also consider a bigger neighborhood like this. Um, it's very easy. You just need to extend this loop by looking to two numbers of your neighbor and checking also here two um, neighboring cells if you're outside of the border. So I don't do this. I keep this up to you to experiment with different neighbors. You can also test if you are able to check only these more neighbors uh, from Neumann neighbors. So this would be this cell and this cell in the extended neighborhood or only the direct Moore neighbor cells like this, the four cells in Moore neighborhood. What you can do as well is um, to change the, the rule, what happens when. You could also include here, um, so this is uh, uh, always the same rule for every cell. You could experiment with different rules for different conditions. You could also make stochastic um, decisions to change a cell. So you could say you add here some kind of random value to decide if a cell should change its state or not. Um, so all these kind of um, aspects you can change in the code. And the idea again is to um, motivate you to understand this code, to work with it and to explore the possibilities of the cellular automata. I hope I have given you a good basis for working with the automata and for finding your creative applications of this method. So enjoy exploring the possibilities and the universe of cellular automata.